Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India So this and uh, the next lecture, uh, we are going to talk about uh, global supply chain redesign. I think uh, you know we are talking of not global supply chain design, but redesign. This is because um, for a number of reasons that we have been dealing with in these lectures. The designs of today, the way you design the supply chains, they are not up to the mark. They are subject to all kinds of pressures, all kinds of disruptions and so on. So there is a need to think about uh, uh, how to redesign the supply chains. So that is what the topic for the this lecture and the next one. Mm -hmm. So we are going to use uh, as before the ecosystem framework to redesign the supply chains. So what people, uh, people design supply chains as simple linear processes of goods and information swiftly passing through an efficient logistics and IT pipeline and concentrate only on that part of the pipe directly controlled by them or at best that of their customers and suppliers. In other words, they are looking at their part. If you are a manufacturer, you look at the manufacturing. If you are a supplier, you look at the uh, supplier. If at the best, some of them, if you are a manufacturer, you look at the supplier and you look at the logistics players, but you do not look at the supplier suppliers. Or if you are a manufacturer, you look at the distributors, but you do not look at the retailers. So if you are a distributor, you look at the manufacturers and the retailers or mostly retailers and do not look at the manufacturing effects. So, that is the current state of affairs and also as we said several times before, it is something like supply chain design, supply chain, supply chain demand, uh, demand supply matching. So that is the kind of thing that uh, we have and this is a myopic view. This has to change and people have to have an idea of the entire supply chain from end to end. From um, uh, materials inputs to uh, the end the customer uh, uh, to the consumer and also look at all the things that are happening the ecosystems the governments in which your suppliers uh, um, are subjected to and so on. So basically you have to take an ecosystem view of this. So what is supply chain redesign? The current supply chain networks as they are designed today and using all kinds of packages like ERP and others are subject to disruptions and innovations in the ecosystem elements, resources crunch and several other factors. In other words, there are disruptions of uh, due to earthquakes and so on, there are disruptions due to financial crisis, there are disruptions to due to wars and there are disruptions to oil price increases and so on. So, but Ultimately, they will affect the, the supply chain performance and also the cost savings. So disruptions can originate from banks, from governments, bankruptcy of suppliers, suppliers, natural disasters, piracy, cyber attacks, port strikes and other, several other unknown factors. So one can say, look, uh, you know, uh, we, do, we do not know where the disruptions are going to come, how can you mitigate them? Well, the issue it is fine, but one cannot anticipate all risks, and but they cannot be ignored either. You cannot say I don't know the risk. These are known unknowns, or unknown unknowns, and so on. You can say all kinds of things. It's a perfect storm. It is something. It is like a black swan, and you can give any number of metaphors and try to escape from that. But at the end of the day, you cannot ignore them. You have to do something to mitigate them. So, not only disruptions, innovations in products, manufacturing and delivery processes, you know, business models, government-government relations such as FTS, 
regulations and deregulations and many more affect the supply chain. So, there are technological disruptions which are happening like the cloud, big data, you name it and wireless cell phones. There are several things which are which are happening which will disrupt your supply chain and fluctuations in resource costs, you know wages, oil prices, foreign exchange are important for the bottom line. For example, the prime thing why outsourcing to low cost countries has been adopted and it was favored by the developing countries and the multinational multinationals is because of the low cost sourcing. But that low cost is disappearing because of the wage increases, oil price increases which will affect the transportation. There is lot of foreign exchange uh, fluctuations where the uh, emerging market currencies are appreciating. So, these will uh, actually are important to the bottom line. So, supply chain designed to take all these factors into account rather than resorting to expediting cost saving measures and unknown strikes. So, what you usually do is uh, you know you basically uh, remove uh, your HR, uh, try to save the costs uh, in several ways, you resort to expediting when your, uh, your logistics does not work and so on. So, but this is not the way of doing it, you should, you should anticipate the disruptions. Maybe you may not be able to avoid them, but when, when they occur you should be able to deal with them and this should be a part of your design. So, it is not as though the disruption strikes you at a later stage and you do not know how to do it. So, okay. So, the global supply chain design consists of two steps according to us and one step is, is this global supply chain formation that is you select all your players all your supplier logistics providers in all countries with whom you want to deal you know given your vertical the given your the kind of products your and services you are providing who are all the people who are relevant to you. This is kind of social network that you prepare from all countries from all over the globe and also assess their performance, know about their countries, know about them, what are the risks, what are the innovations they are going to do and what would be the performance and so on, how do you select them and collect all this information. And building governance mechanisms or frameworks for partner selection, coordination and control. So, as we saw before, governance means partner selection, coordination and control, but in the design stage you should, you should build all the governance mechanisms are frameworks for doing it. When you are doing the governance, you just do follow certain procedures. You run an optimization problem, given an order, you select the supplier, tell him what to do and also execute this and control the entire thing. But you have to build all the mechanisms for doing that. So, let us look at the, the first stage which is global supply chain formation. The formation involves five steps. The first one is map the supply chain ecosystem for the industry vertical. We have done this before, so that is the map the supply chain ecosystem for the particular industry vertical, whether it is auto, whether it is telecom, whether it is uh, uh, logistics or whatever and formulate the supply chain strategy. What is your strategy? Are you supplying the products? Are you supplying services? Are you going to outsource? What are the kinds of innovations you are going to look at? Are you getting to governments which are basically uh, highly, highly innovative into this or you getting into countries where uh, the, they are modest and they may not be too much innovative and so on and select possible locations for factories, the distribution centers based on the investment climate. You look at the countries, where do you want to locate your, uh, your DC distribution centers? You have to know the investment climate uh, based on the ecosystem for that country and identify the supply chain risks. And once you have all this, you have a list of feasible supply chain configurations. In other words, for component one, you have these suppliers in these countries and they, they are, these are the risk profiles. And these countries do these kind of innovations and this is the transportation cost. So, for each supplier, you, you have a database of what are the kinds of things that you use. And have a list of feasible configurations and so on. You are not doing anything except 
having a list of this and maybe rank order the suppliers in terms of their cost performance and all that. So, that is a global supply chain formation. Let us look at each step. And the second one is governance part, uh, second step is governance which involves partner selection, coordination and control. In resilient supply chains, uh, is a separate chain is formed for uh, uh, for each order. The governance function includes partner selection from the group of fee selected suppliers from step 1. And coordination determining who does what, when and communicating to everyone and execution. So, this step involves building frameworks for partner selection, coordination and control for the company or the vertical under consideration. For example, for partner selection, given an order, you want to select the partners for that particular order. So, which will minimize your cost, maximize your lead, minimize your lead time and so on. So, this usually comes into some kind of an optimization problem. And coordination determines who does what and so on. This is the typical supply chain planning problem. And execution is you have to build a tower or monitor the order status so that processes work as per plan and control exceptional events. So, building a control tower or designing a control tower which will monitor all the things that happen in the supply chain so that the execution is perfect. So, these are all the things that, that you need to do in the design stage. So, what is global supply chain formation? It is basically this step is crucial. Now, when you are doing the supply chain formation, for example, you are dealing with apparel, toys or auto and so on, you have to have domain knowledge of the vertical and the companies, their products, capabilities, reputation or quality delivery and corporate and political connections soft skills for negotiation of acquisition of assets, partner selection, uh, risk assessment and talent recruitment. I mean you should this step is crucial for, for all this and in emerging markets dispute over asset acquisition can turn wicked involving long drawn negotiations or abandoning the project. One has to be careful this step people try to ignore, but in emerging markets it can you know when you are trying to you think everything is going on you plan you go ahead you you order your machinery and so on but the, the land and building are not ready and they enter into a dispute so then you get into uh, problems of uh, you know negotiation and all that and sometimes you win sometimes you have to abandon the project go elsewhere so one has to be extremely careful uh, in in this step so, the five steps are map the supply chain ecosystem for the industry vertical. Form uh, this one, I mean these are the five steps that we have. And step one, map the supply chain ecosystem for the industry vertical that we have here. Here is of course the industry value chain suppliers, manufacturing distributors and retailing. And you have the resources which is infrastructure, foreign direct invest, foreign, in, uh, in, uh, foreign investors and ports, airports, industry clusters, human financial, natural resources and also you have the institutions like the customs, uh, export and other regulators, quality control, environmental, social, financial and trade issues. And you have the delivery mechanisms like logistics, transport and logistics parks, etc. So, basically you can for your industry vertical, you, this is a generalized uh, supply chain ecosystem. But for the your, your industry vertical, for example, if it is auto, then you can map the auto one. And if it is say food, you can map the food one. And then these things, the regulations and the resources that are required and the delivery mechanisms, they particularly differ. If it is an electronic supply chain, you may want uh, you may want uh, air delivery. Uh, this one, if it is uh, books uh, supply chain, then you may want. Uh, uh, home delivery, you want uh, e delivery, and so on. So, basically, these things depend on the vertical that you have. So, step two is formulate the supply chain strategy. So, let us look at what is the supply chain strategy here. So, decide on the product you are selling. In other words, are you selling the product in its, uh, uh, in its uh, form or the knowledge of the ecosystem? In other words, uh, you know, in, in situation, if you are a trader, you do not sell any product, you are just orchestrating 
and what you have is your knowledge and connections of the ecosystem with the government, with the other people and so on. You can sell the just the product, you can also sell the solutions like after sales, aircraft engines for example, and Xerox. For example, aircraft engines are never sold, they basically are leased into the, the products and these are called power by the hour. So, the aircraft engine manufacturers are paid for the hour the aircraft engine runs in the aircraft. If the aircraft is not flying, they are not paid. So, if the engine is under repair, they are not paid. So, it is up to the, the aircraft engine manufacturers to be on high alert and make its engine engines on uh, operative each time every, every minute. And similarly, Xerox sells uh, uh, not the printing machines, but uh, they sell they pay charge for page and so on. So, there are some acts and others they sell value chains, deliver building materials to site rather than cement. So, there are several innovations in terms of the business models that you have. So, you should decide what you are selling and depending on that everything else depends. Innovations in products and processes and other ecosystem items to build the blockbuster industry subject to infrastructure constraints. So, in other words, you should look at your ecosystem and what are the kinds of things for the vertical under consideration, what are the innovations that are possible. Deregulation of the airlines or FedEx, courier services, Southwest, uh, direct routes rather than hub and spoke, Tata Nano which is uh, this one clusters, digital delivery, home delivery, that what is that, that are the innovations that are possible. These could be new to the market kind of innovations, they need not have to be new to the uh, new to the uh, uh, world kind of innovations. So, in other words, these could be practiced uh, in other countries by other companies. So, but uh, you have to get them, get them working for your vertical or in your country and identify the strategic areas for partnering or outsourcing in the value chain including the risks of partners. In other words, are you going to do everything yourself? or are you going to do outsource some of this. So, basically make or buy decisions, local or low cost country outsourcing, foreign direct investment or outsourcing. In other words, if you are doing foreign di direct investment, then you are going to have your own plans in the low cost countries or you can outsource, you can have joint ventures, you can have several other things. So, what is that you are going to do? This is a strategy that you need to uh, follow this one. We are going from the start here. I mean, sometimes if your company is operating, you may want to you may want to uh, start in the middle. But the point is that is why we are calling it supply chain redesign. You have already a design. You have an already operations. You have a strategy. But by going through this kind of procedure, then you know uh, you can you can see how you can uh, improve yourself or change things so that you. Uh, uh, you are more competitive. So, there are product innovations uh, for example, in Hyundai a customized small Centro to suit Indian market, Nano is a fuel efficient 1 lakh car, and I said 1 lakh is the price of the car. So, and uh, that is uh, the one and Cummings produces diesel engines and power generators for small retailers, regional hospitals and farmers. So, because there is the power uh, power shutdowns in India for long. So, this this is one that is uh, power generators are very popular in both households as well as in business. And General Electric announced two revolutionary products, $1,000 handheld electrocardiogram and a portable 15,000 PC based ultrasound machines. So, basically these are all used even now in the in the in this originally developed for for uh, emerging markets, uh, the ECG device for rural India and the ultrasound machine for rural China, but now is being sold in US, pioneering new uses of such machines. So, once you have a machine, you could do something. So, these are all product innovations, although done for the emerging market, uh, you know, some of them uh, sometimes these can be uh, transferred, these can be used even uh, in uh, developed markets. So, there is what is called business model innovation. So, business model innovation is reconfiguration of activities of the existing business model of a firm that is new to the product service market in which the firm competes. 
so the way you compete in the pharma is different you may one thing is to sell a product that is one way of doing it. The second thing is you know you can sell a service in other words in a service uh, selling uh, Xerox machines you sell their paid charges. So, for example, instead of selling servers uh, um, and other equipment so on for storage, you can you can lease the space in the storage in cloud computing. So, basically, there are several examples of uh, uh, these business model innovations. Southwest Airlines, for example, when it started, when uh, the airlines were deregulated in the United States. Southwest Airlines borrowed a business model from interstate bus transportation and applied it to airline industry. Well, you can apply it here in India and so on. McDonald's brought traditional assembly line techniques into the fast food business. So, basically if you want to save costs and time and so on, then you have a menu driven uh, service and like it look, looks like an assembly line. Xerox does not sell copying machines, but installs and maintains copying machines in offices and charges on per page basis. And powered by that, our aircraft engines are paid for the number of hours they are flying in a flying aircraft. So, there are various kinds of business model innovations. You have to find out which one suits you best. And use innovations in regulations. The governments have deregulated the telecom industry and made many positive policies allowed private and foreign uh, shops to this one, created special economic zones to attract equipment and other manufacturers, allowed foreign players to participate as manufacturing and service providers and so on. So, companies should use these to advantage. I am just giving you an example of the, the government may deregulate the, this one, but what happens is the companies should use these deregulation to their advantage. For example, if there is a FDI possible, but then they should go to that country where telecom is deregulated and they should use the special economic zones and you should basically participate in manufacturing and service industries. So, when you are selecting a supplier or when you are selecting a country, a location, then it is important what are the possible innovations that you can use given the government regulations. And there are disruptions in the cloud comes in, in a big way. The growth of cloud delivery models help to start up uh, pay per use model rather than buying, installing and maintaining servers. The new cloud architecture can address the needs of orchestrators trying to manage loosely coupled networks. So, one thing that happens is if you do not want to manufacture anything, if you want to do your service, uh, service only kind of thing, then it is possible. Uh, you can use the cloud architecture as an orchestrator. And other industries such as healthcare, finance, logistics, education get disrupted by cloud. In healthcare, patient records can be accessed from the cloud. You know, the cloud is, is something which is being used, uh, this one. For example, if you are an orchestrator, all your information can be, can be in the cloud and uh, you can use and all this big data that is collected by the cloud servered in the servers of all the players, then you can use uh, analytics to find out to plan uh, for your uh, for your services. Cyber security breach of uh, search in our big issues in cloud uh, that is uh, an important thing because this is a concentrated uh, your database at one place. So, your cyber security uh, in other words if somebody hacks into the, your data uh, then uh, you will have problems of uh, this one and also breach of trust. Your cat your uh, cloud operator has to be trustworthy and you should not share your information with others either by design or by, by mistake. So, there are innovations in governance of this one. In other words, what is, how do you want to govern this uh, particular thing? So, you want to <coughs> do not own assets orchestrate new mantra in business. And this is one way of doing it, but you may not be able to switch, switch to this governance model um, right away unless you outsource lot of it. If you are a manufacturer, 
and your competencies or design manufacturing and all that you outsource to the suppliers you outsource to um, to uh, the dealers and retailers and so on you can also outsource all your manufacturing you keep design and so on and you just orchestrate so that is examples of Li and Fang who does not own any factories but orchestrates a network of 15,000 suppliers 29,000 employees in 40,000 40 countries supplying goods to well known consumer brands and similarly Boeing 77 jet assemblies is a 3 million parts for more than 900 suppliers in 17 countries. Southwest JetBlue Ryanair retained only core branding and of the airline and put all other operations for bid. So, they leased the engines, aircraft and contracted out baggage handling and maintenance. So, here what happens is for example, the fourth party logistics providers, they basically own nothing and but they aggregate and provide transport, warehousing, distribution services to several customers by orchestrating the three PLs. So, the point here is that when you are studying during the supply chain formation stage, it is important you look at all the aspects of what are happening, what are the risks you are going to face from each of the suppliers and their ecosystem. What are the innovations in governance you can make? What are the innovations that you can make in products, processes and, and business models and so on? So, that is step 2. I mean the step 3 is select possible locations for the factories DC is based on the investment climate. So, in the first 2 steps you have basically said in the step, first step 1 you have mapped the ecosystem. So, ecosystem gives you an idea of the entire entire vertical or your own company, your resources that you are using, the garments you are in and also the, the delivery mechanisms that, that you use. But then in the step 2, what is that uh, you are doing? You are basically saying the supply chain strategy. What is supply chain strategy? Supply chain strategy involves what are the kinds of uh, uh, you know what are you what are you selling are you selling the product service or combination whatever and the second uh, point uh, there is what are the innovations that uh, that your vertical is doing and others so or what are the kinds of technology disruptions that are happening and it can be through cloud it can be through your product innovations people are producing small cars people are uh, producing using mobile uh, for uh, uh, their communications uh, people are using only atms no bank branches these are all the kinds of things that uh, the, these are things happening and look at your governance innovations in other words you may have a hierarchical structure today or you may have some other structure functional or product oriented structure but then can you use how can you change improve your governance by basically using the new technologies in other words there are technologies uh, for example the uh, the information technologies there are sensor networks there are other things which are coming cloud and all that can you use them to advantage in terms of innovations and what are the risks that are you going to face. Now, step 3 is select possible locations for factories DC is based on the investment climate. So, where are you going to locate your suppliers and so on. So, for the industry vertical study the parameters that determine the investment climate of nations and regions and rank order the regions. You know everything depends on your industry vertical. For example, if you are in oil or if you are in auto, then the day your investment climate is different. And basically, if you are if you are in oil, you should be in oil rich, and there should be shipping uh, infrastructure and other delivery mechanisms and so on. And you should be an expert in foreign exchange calculations and all that. But and, and also you should be prepared to a lot of oil. Uh, trade happens overseas. So, 
basically you should be you should be more than just transporting uh, the oil from one place to the other or a logistics provider or, or managing your inbound logistics. So, identify the asset specific requirements from the suppliers. In other words, if you want to do uh, you want some uh, some product which requires special machines. So, they become asset specific. So, every supplier may not have may not have those kind of machines. So, in which case you need to you need to be use the asset specific requirements specify those things. First, you should know the asset specific things we are going to mention in the next uh, slide that they, they could be site specific, they could be machine specific and so on. So, and also what important are the clusters. Clusters are geographical concentrations of interconnected companies, specialized suppliers, service providers and associated institutions present in a region. In other words, these will provide everything provides uh, at provided at one place. And the proximity of companies and institutions in one location fosters better coordination. So, it is important to see that there is better coordination and trust lowering the transaction costs, minimizing the inventory, importing costs and delays and so on. So, since everybody close then you can basically transfer small amounts, you need not have to keep inventory, you could do follow just in time and several other factors if you are in a, if you are in the same uh, same cluster. So, there is an advantage of uh, being in a cluster and what are the supplier asset specificities that are this one. You may require physical asset specificity which refers to uh, the mobile and physical features of assets such as specific dies, molds and tooling for the manufacturing of a contracted project. So, in other words you may require special tools, special machines and so on for for your this one that is the physical. Their dedicated assets represent uh, specificity represents discrete and or additional investment in generalized production capacity in the expectation of making significant sale of a product of a particular customer. Now, here suppose you are you are looking at green making your products green. When you are making your products green, then you if you were trying to think that because of the green is going to be the fashion of the day, then you are going to have a significant product uh, demand in near future, then you want to have you want to have do an uh, additional investment uh, into the production capacity. Well, you may do it as you as the owner of a manufacturing, but you need to have the, the suppliers also do their capacity expansions. So, dedicated asset specificity, it represents the additional investment in production capacity with the expectation that you are going to make it big next day. Human asset specificity it requires in a learning by doing fashion with long standing customer specific expectations. So, in other words for example, all the software providers, these companies both in India and abroad, they basically take graduates and then train them uh, in, in all software languages as well as uh, uh, in programming and others. They have their own institutions where people are trained. So, in other words, this is this is a, a specific asset that you have to create, and it costs money. But you are doing skill-based training for this. So this is this is the kind of training. Or is your supplier going to do it? Well, he may do it, but he will he will charge you. So, but he may charge it. But you may import all the specific skills that uh, you you have. And site-specific as a, uh, as a specificity site. Asset specificity refers to successive stages that are immobile and are located in close proximity to one another so as to economize on inventory or transportation. Now, supposing you have a port where you want to send all your goods. So, if you want to have a distribution center near the port, so that what you could do is to uh, get a uh, manufacturing site nearby and from the get all your suppliers to supply have a supply hub near the manufacturing or near the DC 
and uh, transport via the port. So, to do all this that means uh, somebody here your logistics provider has to build uh, a warehouse or your suppliers uh, uh, suppliers need to have a supply hub near your manufacturing facility. So, these are all becomes uh, site specific. What happens once you build and if the situation changes? Then you, this may not be may not be useful. So there is a risk associated with this, with all this. For example, if you build a warehouse, and if the demand drops, the warehouse becomes empty. So if it is a specific temperature sensitive warehouse, then uh, you know you have invested a lot in the in the air conditioning and other temperature uh, sensitive things, and those things may go waste. So, there are also what are called global competitiveness indicators which uh, uh, which require uh, attention. Uh, you know these are these are basically uh, to look at the country where you are in and the competitiveness indicators are national policies for openness in trade and market. You know when you are looking at your supplier, you are looking at also his eco his or her, eco, her ecosystem. Now, one of the things of the ecosystem of the supplier is the governments. So, the national policies and openness of trade and the markets. You are not, you are interested, you want to get, get uh, outsource something to them, but what are the national policies of the suppliers? So, best practices for international trade. So, in other words, do you have trade facilitation and others or it takes uh, one month or two months is it very expensive uh, uh, to to uh, uh, for transport and so on and do you have legal and enforcement systems in case of problems do you have judiciary effective judiciary so that becomes an important thing infrastructure for a global economy do you have ports airports do you have uh, uh, freight corridors and so on financial services for a cross border commerce now you have a lot you have to deal with foreign, uh, uh, foreign exchange and transfers so you should have financial services for cross borders that is the banks on either side which will deal with your this one but of course you need human capital so if you are looking at uh, global competitiveness indicators like this all these things become very important so when you are selecting a supplier or you are selecting a place for your DC or you are supplying a place for something, then you should have a look at the uh, the country's global competitiveness indices, their judiciary that is very important and their best practices in international trade because that affects your transportation costs and national openness and so on. Supposing they suddenly say they might turn protectionist, then you would be in trouble. So, it is very important that uh, one should look at the national competitiveness. So, if you look at the national competitiveness industries, so there is a, there are uh, uh, material available or information available on uh, the global uh, government policies and their exemplars, exemplars are 80 percent. Whereas, if you look at uh, top 5 exemplars are 70 percent and OECD countries are 72 percent. But if you look at all the BRIC countries like China, India, Russia and Brazil, they are basically between 40 and 50. For example, India is 40, 42 percent and Russia is a little better 45 and Brazil is also 43 and China is 50 percent. So, I think you will find in terms of the policies these are exemplar countries and these are all the BRIC countries where a lot of things are happening. You will find uh, countries that have very good growth record like China, India, Vietnam, Laos, Indonesia, Pakistan, Bangladesh rank very low on these indices and countries which rank very high they do not attract much trade. So, there is some kind of a <coughs> dichotomy here, it is not necessary that you have a good 
I think that uh, uh, you should uh, you should have very good growth. But what this diagram tells you is whether you can have this one. The people who are doing this uh, trading here are facing a risk. They are taking risk here. Whereas if you are in these countries, the risk will be less. So what? probably is to their low cost countries their growth is uh, high here and if you are having good products you should have short term investments into this. In other words for a specific order if you are doing the apparel order or if you are doing uh, electronic orders you should do very short to minimize your uh, this one. In other words uh, you should finish your transactions within, uh, within 6 weeks so that before any changes happen. So, these are about national policies so that are important for this and investment climate at various levels. You know, you look at uh, the, uh, the country that they are in and what are the levels, logistics and IT regulations, resources and management. That is the country competitiveness index which you can, which you can generate by looking at infrastructure, 3PL, software developers and software infrastructure. And you can look at the customs, trade, tax policies, industry, FDI, incentives, labor, unions, foreign exchange, legal enforcement and so on. You can look at the resources, human financial, natural resources, mines, land, water and management skills. So these are all the ones that determine the country competitiveness. So you can have a scale, you can uh, basically uh, whatever is important to your vertical. You can scale them up and add them so, so that you can get a score for a country, for a particular supplier in a particular vertical at that time. As you can understand that things can change. For example, the regulations can change. The resources can become expensive. So, you should once the resources become expensive, the logistics becomes expensive. So, if you are looking at short term, then it is fine, but if you are doing a longer term, uh, then uh, these things could, could change very fast. And regions, you know, if you are looking not a country, because, but regions, regional logistics and IT infrastructure, whatever is relevant. And government policies, in other words, their state government, center state relations, tariffs, duties, sales taxes and these are all the same as above. So, if you take some states, some states have more natural resources than the others. Some states have more agriculture than, than industry and so on. So, basically you should look at for each state and then get what is called regional competitiveness index or state competitiveness index. Well, you can have vertical this one, vertical specific logistics and IT infrastructure. As we said several times before, if your vertical is oil and gas, you need ports, you need uh, 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 several other things for oil. Whereas uh, uh, the uh, the regulations are very heavy in terms of uh, in terms of oil because you have to have relationship with uh, with the countries who have oil, and uh, then the oil prices change every day if oil exchange becomes an issue. And mining and other skilled resources are needed for uh, uh, the industry vertical and clusters, R&D labs and so on. So, the kind of resources that you need for the at the vertical level is different. So, you can have the vertical competitiveness index that uh, for, for that. But of course, you can have at the company level, you can do the same things and have the firm competitiveness. So, in other words, when you it may look at the oh, you are doing too much of homework for this. It is important for this. This homework basically reveals under discussions or brainstorming reveals what is good for you and what is bad for you. So the good for you, what are the innovations you can make, and uh, the bad, and also it will tell you which one to avoid, which country should we avoid, and what field. So. It is very important that you make this kind of analysis on the investment climate before this. And what are these transaction costs? Transaction costs are the production quality and 
and uh, these are the cars that uh, you have and you have the delivery cars, shipping, inventory, asset specific, hard soft infrastructure. Now, for example, in terms of delivery, sometimes it has to be asset specific. Supposing you are transferring uh, big huge equipment, power plant equipment like boilers and all that, they have to be specially dissected first, disassembled and then reassembled at the place and they have to be carefully uh, loaded onto the truck and from truck to the ship and then uh, from there. So, you require asset specific inbound logistics for this kind of thing. So, you should you should be careful while you are doing the quote. And asset specific clusters, human financial power and so on. So, if you if you are in a, what depending on the business you should if you have say um, in the auto business then you have auto clusters. If you are in electronic then you have electronic clusters. If you are in mobile business you have such clusters. But these clusters may not be there in every country. So, one has to look at uh, the asset specific resources and so on. And of course, the institutions uh, effect on social groups, the taxes, tariffs and uh, free trade agreements and so on. And also, you have coordination costs or broker fees that happens. So, the search costs, the, all these things, there are a lot of search costs that are involved in the supply chain formation stage. But they are companies which basically have people in various countries collecting information on their vertical, which are the companies, what are the trade policies, what are the government, uh, this one, which, which state is better, where should I go, these kind of things. So, that will gives you what is called the transaction cost. So, if you, if you look at uh, the, we should, the next step is identify all the supply chain ecosystem risks. What are the risks that the supply chain ecosystem faces? All possible social, political, environmental risks that may affect your ecosystem and the goods, information and financial flows. Estimate the risk and identify what it takes for the resolution. This becomes this becomes very important and you have to make a list of all the risks that, that can come from all the uh, this one, not only your supply chain, from your resources, from the governments, from your delivery mechanisms and so on. So, outsourcing, for example, when you outsource, there is a loss of IP. When you outsource to somebody, you have to basically uh, train them uh, to use your uh, your software or uh, how to design your particular product and so on, quality issues, transport delays, foreign exchange fluctuations, energy cost escalation, loss of goods due to theft, piracy and so on. So, there when you try to outsource and when you are doing something either during the process of manufacturing or during the transport, there are several things that can happen. In case of mergers and acquisitions, all the risks associated with their supply chain ecosystem must be considered. Supposing when you are doing mergers acquisition with a particular company, you not only look at their financial and other this one, you should look at their suppliers, suppliers, suppliers and so on and there you should look at their government. You may buy a particular company, but or you may you may this one the government may have some hidden clause somewhere which will not uh, allow you to function uh, independently. So one has to be careful in terms of mergers, acquisitions, and so on. Large scale and high degree concentration. For example, there are giant firms. Everybody thinks of big firms. There is uh, a one. Uh, 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 this one like DHL, Flexatronics, etc. that uh, they have four big firms, but then what happens is when your firm which is located in various countries, various where, everything affects your company. So, 
your and also if you have clusters like low cost clusters in China, IT clusters in India and these clusters become very highly vulnerable because they are all co-located and anything that happens uh, like natural disasters or any terrorist strikes. So, basically they can they can get into get into problems. So, it is large scale versus dispersed this one. Of course, it is very important if you have clusters, if you have close by a concentration then it is easy during normal times, but when disaster strikes then you will have problems. So, the, the supply chain risks are uh, political and societal risks, land acquisition or people displacement are involved risks such as change in the government, state center relations, corruption, social factors these are also need to be assessed. So, basically you have uh, these kind of uh, risks everywhere. If resource incentive shortages such as infrastructure, oil, power, water, mining etc. should be quantified. It becomes highly important that you do. So, then you have uh, the cyber security the biggest risk of connectivity. In other words, when you are connecting to the internet and you have a cluster which is uh, or you have in a, in a cloud platform which is operating all your which is storing all your data and so on, then you have a biggest risk of connectivity. So, computer systems are subject to electronic attacks originating from sources that are usually unidentified. You do not know where who is stealing your data and so on. The terrorist and counterfeit networks are also globally connected and they follow the same HR process of recruitment training people and also systematic planning processes for implementing their objectives. So, one has to be extremely careful because your rivals are also as good as you or better sometimes and they are doing in secrecy whether you plan everything and you plan the times and all that they are doing everything in secret way. So, that is where the desire comes. So, I think uh, in the next lecture I will talk about the feasible supply chain configuration uh, for implementation. <laughs>